what is the average length of a worm in my garden? Well, the simple way to measure that would be for me to uh, take my entire garden length, dig every single bit up, get all of the worms out of it, and measure every single one. And that would be a measurement of the population as a whole. That's a terrible idea. I tend to have a lot of plants in here that I like to uh, not kill, and I also, you know, I mean, I have better hobbies to do. So what is the average length of a worm in my garden? Well, what I could then do is I could take a sample from my garden. So let me just uh, grab a sample here. <sighs> this part right here is where I grew my potatoes. They did well and they're gone now. So single sample, let's actually move aside the mulch. spread this on top here. Well now there's a problem. No worms. One reason for that might be it is very dry. Are there worms in my garden? Well yes. But as you see the sample didn't reflect the population at all. Now I could, um, I could also just take this over here This is my compost. I keep a tarp over it to keep it moist. Boy. I can take the length of this and that would be one worm. I could then go grab another one, measure that worm, and another one, measure that worm. Get my sample. Now you've noticed a problem with my sampling already. There is not a uniform dispersion of worms within my garden. There is a clumped dispersion of worms in my garden. And if I wanted to get any of the worms, I really have two choices. One is to dig really deep where some worms still are, even though it's gotten rather dry lately. The other option would be to take my compost as a sample. Now the sample and the compost are going to be necessarily larger because, um, well, that's, uh, that's the best food in the garden right there. It's a really good supply. If you sample close to the top, you're actually going to get the smaller worms because larger worms tend to burrow deeper. I've found this by going for fishing worms. So, But what I'm showing you is the population is not evenly distributed. So a good sampling scheme would be needed in order for me to answer a relatively simple question. Now I could actually dig all day in the upper levels there and not get a single worm, and that would be a poor sampling choice. So. How do we adequately sample a population? So let's sample a population in theory. I want you to be able to define mark recapture method, the central limit theorem, what is a statistic, where, what are type one and type two errors, what is a normal distribution as well as a bimodal distribution, and what are tails, modes, and also probably skew if you don't know what that is already. Compare the sample mean to the population mean and analyze the experiment for sources of sampling bias as well. Oh, calculate the biodiversity is not going to be on this one. I'll delete that objective. I seem to be missing my glasses. There we go. Random sampling. So think about the sample. Sample is really the data you're going to get. So we don't really, if we just grabbed a random chunk of worms from my garden, we don't really know what the average um, worm length is in my garden if we just grab a sample. We don't know what the deviation is. We don't really know what the distribution type is. That's a normal distribution or bimodal distribution. We don't really know anything. Just grab a sample at random and see what we can get. And there are going to be biases introduced as well, depending on what the population is actually doing and depending on the testing methods we use. So a random sample is going to be the one we want. So how do you randomly sample? 
that actually implies you already know some things about the population. So let's say you had a hypothesis that people in Olympia have healthier eating habits than the national mean. Okay, we can grab the national mean from a database. Don't sure what database, but we could in hy <laughs> hypothetically for this little uh, this little fun thing. So when we take our sample at a farmer's market, when we go to Fred Meyer's, would we go to that local eatery known as The Rock? Or could we browse Instagram for people's food photos? How could we randomly sample people? You might be thinking, well, I guess I could just start at um, Henderson Boulevard and go east to Marvin Boulevard, uh, Mar Marvin Way, and just randomly sample a person every 50 meters. I could just grab them off the street and um, put them in a box and then question them until I know what their food habits are. I mean. It's a hypothesis. We can do these things. That would be a good way, but in that case, we are we're introducing some bias, aren't we? People who are out walking, people who aren't already in a restaurant, people on Martin Way, Harrison Way. Seems like reasonable transect through Olympia. But what would our random sample really be? And it's always a good question. You have to actually know some things about the population before you can say your sample is random. So let's think about this in terms of what your sample is versus the total population. We have X, and that's the sample mean. <coughs> for my worms, uh, that was probably about a two centimeter long worm. That's your sample mean for mean worm length. That may or may not actually equal something known as mu, which is the population mean. I can tell you flat out it doesn't. I can tell you that I have sampled worms by garden before, and that probably three or four centimeters is mu. Um, depends what time of year it is, too. Mm, interesting. Anyway, you call any value like x, your sample mean, that we're going to get from the values in your sample a statistic. So our standard deviation is a statistic. Our, um, our mean is a statistic. Our mode is a statistic. And they may or may not actually be close to the population. So how would we know? And that comes to something that brings something called the sampling distribution. So sampling distribution. Imagine we've taken five recordings of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Symphony. One is twenty nine point six minutes. Another twenty nine point nine minutes. Thirty point zero minutes. Thirty point two minutes and thirty point eight minutes. During any month on a certain channel, your Pandora three of those recordings are going to be played for each listener. This can be randomly sampling three out of five. So we've sampled the 29.6, 29.9, and 30, the three shortest. We're going to get a sample median of 29.9. If we got 30.0, 30.2, and 30.8, the sample median is 30.2. What is the actual median? That's right, 30.0. And what you notice is four times out of there, we sample one that the sample median becomes 30.0. So if we sampled three recordings out of the five, our median matches the actual median of the population four out of 10 times. That's all the possible combinations of samples there. And what you see is more often than not, medians match, giving sufficient samplings. And that's called the sampling distribution. Oh. Distribution, yeah. What are your samples showing if you do repeated samples? That's your sampling distribution. What are your samples showing if you do repeated samples? And it brings us to something known as the, oh, the probability distribution. Sorry, there you go. Um, hold on, jumps ahead. Okay, cool. One slide off. Um, you have three recordings. There are 10 separate um, assortments. If you had a sample of 10,000 and you took samples of 50, what would your sampling distribution look like? Would you get your height, your mean height, your median height matching the population's median height? What if you took sample? I know if you took a sample of 10,000, you'd get the median height matching the median height because that's the whole population there. So what is your sample and what is the likelihood you're going to get that? It's your distribution. So your sampling distribution is going to produce its own mean. And the variance in that sampling distribution decreases by increasing the sample size. If I took four recordings, 
then more often than not, the median is going to be, well, in fact, five, okay, four recordings, you're not going to get a median because it's four values, but in fact, five recordings, the median is always going to be equal to the um, actual median. So the variance is going to decrease. Basically, that, um, that distribution, your sampling distribution, is going to get smaller. If you're sampling from a normal distribution, the sampling distribution will also be normal. It will actually be centered on the population mean for any sample size. Brings us to a concept called the central limit theorem. If a large enough sample size, then the sampling distribution becomes approximately normal, given a normal distribution. This is a good reason to pick a large sample size. Is your probability of getting a sample that matches the population increases the more the larger your sample. It also increases that you'll get a sampling distribution that more count that more appro approximately relates to the actual distribution if you have more samples. So large sample size, repeated samples, this would be good. If I were to replace my shovel with a big, big bucket, well that would be a better sample. But I showed that there was error in my measurements, and there are errors that you can get. So my worms were not evenly distributed, dispersed, sorry, were not evenly dispersed through the soil. So what I could say is my worms are actually going to be below three millimeters. And I, or maybe, yeah, I could say that. So that'd be a hypothesis. So, or I could say, you know, actually, let's say, yeah, they, the null hypothesis, if I, my hypothesis is they're below three millimeters, is the null hypothesis in that case would be there's no significant difference from three millimeters. So let's say I sampled the worms. So are they or are they not significantly different than three millimeters? Well, I sample the top level of soil. And I get 100 worms, which are between 1.5 and 2 millimeters. Okay, so that's um, my null hypothesis was that there's no significant difference. I end up finding out that it is significant, but the actual worms are not. So a type 1 error is that incorrect rejection of a true null hypothesis. In reality, there's no significant difference between my worm size and 3 millimeters. But when I sample, I find only very, very small worms. So I'd be like, oh my gosh, it's significant. And probability of a type 1 error is known as something alpha. So you see that generally alpha equals 0 0.05 because we try to get a p less than 0 0.05. We want to have a, 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 a our probability that we're incorrectly rejecting a null hypothesis to be less than 5%. We also have a type 2 error. A type 2 error is a failure to reject a false null hypothesis. So if I said that my worms were 3 millimeters, and in reality, the average worm size was 10 millimeters, or centimeters, let's say centimeters, um, I, I say my, my null hypothesis is my worms are not significantly different than a 3 centimeter worm. In reality, the mean worm size is 10 centimeters. Let's pretend they're huge worms. Um, it's, it's, 25 inches long. It's like a two foot worm. No, it's not. Sorry, 2.5. It's like five inches long. Just, there you go. Um, so it's a failure to reject <coughs> a false null hypothesis. So you say, eh, my sample isn't actually significantly different than the null. It's nothing. But it actually, in reality, you're wrong. It is significant. And the probability of a type 2 error is called beta. We generally don't use beta as much. Failure to reject a false null hypothesis, we don't generally deal with as much. But these are two types of errors that could be made. I will most likely ask on an exam, what type of error might this person be making? And I want you to be able to look into, um, into your average scientific paper and see, is there a likelihood of a type 1 or type 2 error? Usually we look for our type 1 errors. So it's some benefits and problems. Let's say there's a study on chlorogenic acid. Okay, chlorogenic acid is this 
uh, it's a plant produced metabolite. It doesn't really do much, but let's say finding it, they find with a 95.1% certainty equals, you know, P equals 0 0.49, 0 0.049. Um, having a diet with 40 milligrams of chlorogenic acid per day results in a weight loss of two kilograms. Let's say that was a type one error, actually. They may have found a weight loss drug, but there's actually, they incorrectly rejected a true null hypothesis. So in reality, chlorogenic acid doesn't do anything, but they found it did. And that may have been an incorrect rejection of a true null hypothesis. They could just make money off of something that does not actually work. A study on the effects of hydrofracking found no significant change in water quality. Now, this is what they actually did this. Their sampling method was, so let's say they found that, oh, it's P equals 0 0.051, so there's no significant change in water quality. Well, that's a type two error, failure to reject a false null hypothesis. In reality, there was a change in water quality, and the study could have found that there are no problems where one did exist. It also makes money. Hold on. Are you saying that people make money pretty much no matter what when they do bad statistics? Well, crap. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of these in the real, real world. People will make an error, bias their sample, and make type 1s or type 2s that result in making money. Huh. Problem. All right. On to the next thing. The distributions of actual populations. Not to be confused with a sampling distribution and not to be confused with a distribution of a species. Sorry, we reuse that word a bit. So this is a normal distribution. The most common one. It's generally assumed for populations, but it's not always true. If it looks like your population is not normal, this is something that you really should check. But it probably is normal. Uh, most statistical tests are designed for a normal distribution. So a type two, a T tests and ANOVAs, uh, you assume a normal distribution first. And uh, we, we've covered those, hopefully, we've been working through those in lab. Bimodal. A bimodal distribution has two peaks. More than two peaks is a multimodal distribution. You see here the uh, the grade distribution, your number of students versus uh, grade percentage. I think I think that's from my Bio 141 class. Number of students, yeah, probably 141, 142. It's not really bimodal, but you do notice is there's almost a second hump around that 80 to 90 range. That's common. Um, this is not from my Bio 142 class. I generally don't have that many failing. <laughs> Actually looking at the percentage. No, 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 no. 25 getting 40 to 50%. No, that would be bad. Um, oh, dear. So this uh, bimodal distribution is actually common in 141, 142. We'll get people who are first year, first gen. And they're going to be usually performing a little, not, little worse than people who are um, taking that class as, um, as what do you call it, an elective, or who are non-traditional. And they're just what really determines the grade in 141, 142 is preparation. Like, that's the main deal. Do you know how to study? That actually creates a bimodal distribution in most 141, 142 classes. We actually know this as professors, that do you know how to study? creates a bimodal distribution. And uh, fun fact, if you take a student who does, who does know how to study and you partner them with someone who doesn't know how to study, that's beneficial to both of them. So you're looking back at this bimodal distribution that the professors know about full well, and we see it every year, and then you're wondering why there are so many partner activities. Turns out this is somewhat true for your class as well. It's just determined by writing ability. Some of you know how to write better than others. So you're going to see some partnering to turn that bimodal distribution, which statistically causes problems, into more of a normal distribution, pulling people up, of course. That's kind of the fun of this. Uh, these exist in, uh, in my life. 
Um, for the Mendelian genetic trait with recessive and dominant, you can actually find a bimodal distribution as well. You'll find um, a clump of dominants and a clump of recessives. So, skew. Don't like these. Skew and tails. I like a negative, I like a skew distribution when it comes to grades. I like most of the grades uh, between 80 and 100%. And that's a good skew. That means that the mean, median, and mode are not the same, though. So my mean for <clears throat> bio 141, 142 is generally 78 to 80%. My mean for bio 359 is generally 80 to 84%. The median for bio 359 is higher than that. So there is generally a higher median for bio 359, somewhere around 88%. The mode, however, can be different as well. So that negative skew is generally due to one or two students who are getting um, very poor grades. And in Bio 141, 142, it's often due to students who are signed up for the class but haven't been showing up for four weeks. And that can lead to a long tail. So this can be found in grades, yes. You can also have natural selection, which might actually be eliminating half of the population. Um, your tail is those few that survive, but natural selection is not on their side. Age distributions in forests are often skewed. If there has been a recent disaster, there will be a skew towards young trees. If there has been no disaster, there's a skew towards old trees because young ones don't survive in the shade. So we get these pretty often in nature and in grades. So the most common is normal in nature and bimodal in early grades, but skew distributions can be found too. And there's usually a good cause for something like this. All right, distributions in society. We presume that IQ is normal, and this, this is actually kind of an interesting one, is I, I, I grew up in a biased society. I grew up with um, only people who were in private school, private university, and PhD program. I always assumed that everyone was smarter than me. Um, it turns out that if I have a, an IQ of, you know, 130, then um, there's a lot of people on that other side. One of kind of bracing down the political spectrum is probably normally distributed. No, 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 uh, Dr. Bodie, Dr. Bodie, no, no, no. There are left leaning liberal crazy crats and fascists. No, actually, most people are moderates. Like, almost certainly, if you took someone and just took them on a relatively unbiased survey, you'd probably find they're somewhere in the middle. Are you for or aborting children? Well, no, that's mad. Are you for denying women all health care? Well, no, that's madness. Well, then you're in the middle. Political spectrum, guys, remember, you hear about the crazy zones because the media likes to sample repeatedly from those. It's not a random sample, guys. So remember, there's a good reason to calm down and be friends with people because it's probably actually a normal distribution. Um, sexuality. The distribution of sexuality is assumed in America to be highly sexualized. Um, we assume that everyone is just, you know, always getting busy. And that's just the media portraying that because that's a lot more fun than portraying people who are just asexual. And that's fine. There's probably a distribution and it may be normally distributed where the average person is actually not your stereotypical media and not asexual. It's probably actually a normal distribution. This is nature. Uh, gender distribution. That's a good question that I have absolutely no way to answer. But I can tell you, politically, guys, it's not everyone just crazy or crazy. There's a lot of sane people. I'm a moderate. I mean, a little more Republican, but I'm a moderate. And that's what a lot of people are. IQ is presumed normal. Just because most people in college seem to be smarter than you, Remember, there are lots of people outside college. The distributions in society can be a bit of encouragement. We're not all insane. All right. So back to sampling. And this time we're going to think about measuring populations. So sampling, we're going to measure a population. And this, this goes with the distribution as well. A little tougher to see that. But 
We can measure the population density and we can measure the population quantities and qualities based on the direct count of the entire population. I dig up the whole garden and get all the worms. Extrapolation from small samples. I get five small samples of worms and say the rest are like those. You've seen the biases in those. Or there is the mark recapture method. I want to kind of go into that a little more in detail. So the mark recapture method is a good ecological technique. You're going to collect a certain number of individuals in a population, and then you're going to release those back into the natural population, and then uh, turn, then collect again and figure out the ratio of marked to unmarked individuals. So this is an example in Amherst, New York. They took five transects and just put rat traps, and they wanted to see how many rats are there. So they took these transects, put the traps down, and then when the tra rats got trapped, they marked the rats and released them back in the population. And they then collected rats again, and saw how many were marked and how many were not marked. So there's your first sample of rats. They collected six rats, marked those six rats, released them, and they were assuming they distributed randomly within that population, that the six rats didn't just kind of hang out together. Recaptured, and out of six rats, they got one. So they one-sixth were captured the first time, is what they can imply. One-sixth were recaptured out of six captured. So the n equals your number marked times number captured second capture divided by the number of marked recaptured in your second sample. That's your n. So in this case, they could guess that so they had 6 in the first sample times 6 in the second sample divided by 1 marked recaptured. So 6 times 6 is 36, and 1 had been marked and recaptured. So 36 divided by 1 is assuming 36 rats. There are some assumptions in this. Let's say the animal learns that there is uh, food in the trap. So this funny story about a man trying to catch a, no, it was, it was one of my friends actually trying to catch a groundhog. So she tried to catch a groundhog. She got a possum. She released the possum. The next day she got a possum. And my guess is that she released the possum. The possum's like, okay, I got room and board. All I had to do was go in that trap. The next day he's like, but go in that trap again, get free room and board. So she gave up on capturing the groundhog because she may have had a trap happy possum. She had a trap shy groundhog, didn't capture any groundhogs. Um, fun little story, there's also uh, voles. If you capture voles, you never capture two voles because when you get one vole, if the second vole comes in, then the weaker vole gets eaten. So you capture one vole and blood. And you're assuming a random mixing of the marked to unmarked. This is where it may have help to move the traps, but not a lot. So, yeah, these are some assumptions based in that. So we have actually found uses for this in the drug and alcohol use in the medical field, or estimating a population with certain conditions. So capturing and recapturing people with uh, diabetes who showed up with certain symptoms gave a certain sample of, well, how many people total have diabetes? Uh, this has actually been used on the homeless population. They mark and recapture the homeless. Now, the problem with this, the problem with this is the interaction between government and hope and homeless is do you think that homeless people want to be captured and marked? What does that seem to say? What kind of message is that sending? Okay, well, we don't mark them. We just ask them for personal details. Okay, so the government has captured you and is or is interviewing you for personal details do you give them your personal information remember that a lot of the homeless population suffer from mental health issues um, schizophrenia is very common paranoia is very common and just a general distrust of the government is very common so this is not a functional method where mark recapture works because they're essentially trap shy so there are biases inherent in the mark recapture method that make it less of a random sample but it works pretty well for 
some studies. Just know whether or not your sample actually is going to reflect the population as a whole.